Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for the invitation, this opportunity to give this presentation. Uh, and uh, talking about EEG, it turns out that I'm almost seamlessly following on where a previous talk by Fred Wilson has left us with. I'm talking about EEG as a, as a tool. Uh, concerning translation, I will start with the clinical side and work myself a little bit back into the preclinical later. And I would like to present some joint work uh, on, on highlighting on what we see in the EEG with respect to neurological or psychiatric disorders and how it can help us in, in drug uh, development. I myself, I'm also a professor, associate professor at the Medical University of Vienna. I'm a part-time employee with Siesta Group, so I guess this is also my disclosure statement. Uh, let me quickly say who we are, the Siesta Group. We wouldn't so much call ourselves a CRO, contract research organization, but a service provider. So we do help sponsors, uh, pharmaceutical companies, and CROs to implement the measurement of EEG in preclinical or clinical trials and do the central uh, data analysis. We also work very, work very much in the area of sleep, where we develop the world's most validated software for analyzing uh, sleep EEG, so analyzer 24-7. Uh, also, when I talk about EEG here, uh, I talk about all, pretty much all the paradigms there are. I know some people like to distinguish between EEG and ERP, event-related potentials. For me, it's all the surface electrode, electrophysiological measurement, and then how, how you apply it and how you analyze the data might be different, but EEG certainly encompasses everything. You can do the signal, uh, signal channel analysis, Quantitatively, based on spectral analysis, you can look at the event-related potentials when you have triggered stimuli. You can look at topographies across the scalp. And with the techniques like Loretta, you can even look at quasi-tomographies uh, of, of, of your activity in the brain. Uh, included also, as I mentioned already, I would include in EEG analysis sleep. Uh, sleep polysomnography contains EEG, as you, many of you know, as a, as a main component. And uh, the typical way of analyzing it is, 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 is dividing the night into sleep stages and then deriving parameters from that. I think we'll hear more about sleep a little later. Uh, uh, but also, and that's an interesting intersection between the other parts of EEG, you can use sleep EEG also as a kind of stable biomarker of, of, for PDPK modeling, for instance, when, you, when a drug is taken in the evening beyond this sleep staging. The endpoints we saw already in the previous talks, what, what, what variables we can take out of the EEG, I mean, all kinds of uh, 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 power measurements you typically divide into, into bands. We've seen that already. You can look at that as an absolute uh, power or relative to the others. In uh, event-related potentials, we have the different latency to the components and their amplitudes. And we have a whole bunch of variables uh, from uh, sleep that we can also take in, into account. Fred Wilson previously already said, I mean, on one hand, there's a, a lot of power in there. The EEG can tell us very much and um, people who have used it uh, have, have profited from this power. It's a very objective measurement. It's cost efficient, not only financially, but also what you do to the, to the, to the, to the uh, subject. It's, it's very non-intrusive. And it helps us answer questions like, is my drug active in the brain at all? How does it act? So what does it do to those different variables? Where does it act? So in, in to topography or tomography-wise, when does it act? So the time resolution of EEG uh, helps us answer questions about timing as well, and at which dose. And that, at the same time, especially when you, we look at the where and the how, how is reflected by the many variables I already listed to you, and where uh, we multiply those variables by several positions, 19 electrodes positions or even more, uh, and you get this large number of variables that horrifies every statistician that we typically talk about. So the question is now, what do we focus on when, when we look at these many variables? And the answer that I want to promote here, similar to what we heard previously, is that we look at specific patterns, not at single variables, but at combinations of variables uh, that will tell us a certain story. 
uh, that those combinations of different variable and variable changes tell us something about behavioral changes about physio physiology uh, was already discovered very early on. Like Fink already in 1964 published work on showing that certain types of EEG uh, band activity, if it changes, for instance, slow activity goes up, it, it corresponds to like uh, decreased perceptual discrimination or motor activity, or if beta goes up, uh, then uh, fear and anxiety go down and so on. So that all led people like uh, uh, one of our main shareholders, Bern Saletu, whose work I'm, I'm partly presenting here, or our chief scientific officer, Peter Andera, to coin this principle that, that this talk is about, the key lock principle, saying if you look at those patterns as the different changes and compare them with what changes in a disorder, then you might discover a very nice fit. One fits the other. So spelled out, the key lock principle, as Bern Saleto has, has coined it, means that res representative drugs of the main psychopharmacological classes induce as compared to placebo, significant and typical changes in the EEG and in terms of patterns. So we're not looking at single variables, but at patterns. And in many variables, not at all, it's not a perfect tool, these changes are opposite to differences between patients suffering from mental disorders. And that's the, the key to the key lock, to the use of this key lock principle um, uh, that can help us really uh, to, to see the information in the EEG that will lead us to, to, to finding out what our drug is doing. Let me give you an example. Here's some work from 2005, four different drugs, including lorazepam, which we heard about already, already today also. And we see, we look at a, a subset of those variables. We look at delta, theta, alpha, beta, uh, beta 1, 2, 3 bands in the, e, in the quantitative part of the EEG, the spectral, and we see that some of the drugs decrease, uh, others increase uh, uh, due to uh, these drugs as compared to placebos. So the, the one side of this is we look at what a drug does when you compare it to placebo in normal subjects. So if I plot this, for instance, I plot the different bands from delta to beta 3, and I plot the patterns that those four different drugs show. Lorazepam, for instance, decreases delta, theta, increases beta, whereas others like hal haloperidol would increase everything and so on. So you see the different patterns that, that uh, the drugs induce. Let's take one of them, lorazepam, and take this pattern and you can recognize that the analogy, this is like a pattern that uh, one of our typical traditional keys has. So lorazepam, so that would be the key for which we would li like to look for, uh, the, 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 for which we would like to identify the proper lock. Now the proper lock would be found when you look at the disorder, in that case, general anxiety disorder or GAD. Uh, so here we're looking at patients versus controls, and see in what variables do they significantly differ. And we look at the same set of variables. We look at delta, theta, alpha, and beta, and identify certain positive or negative differences. Again, when we plot those, we see, for instance, there's an increase in delta, theta, alpha, a decrease in alpha 2 and beta. And this is now the pattern that, uh, that uh, 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 characterized this disorder and for which we can use the key that we drawn previously, just need to turn it around and then you see it matches exactly. It's an increase, where, uh, so it's a decrease whenever that we, uh, we, we observe an increase and it's a decrease whenever we, we observe an increase uh, and so on. So it, that's what Soleto and others mean by the key lock principle, if we look at patterns of, of differences between patients of a certain disorder and controls, and correspondingly we look at patterns of changes that a drug induces in, uh, ver as compared to placebo 
in normal, uh, so for, for finding this, these patterns out, for this, this type of biomarker st study, we wouldn't even need patients and, and see how much they fit into each other, uh, fit it with each other, and therefore use this as the tool for identifying uh, the right drug effect. So Litter et al. in 2006 continued this and did this in a whole um, array of different drug classes and disorders. So here's a picture from that publication where you see the column again is one. In this case, it's one drug. Again, drug versus placebo. So all that is depicted here are the differences between drug versus placebo. Blue is negative, red is positive. And you see here again the different variables, absolute band powers, relative band powers, centroid frequencies. And you have here uh, a set of drugs including neuroleptics, antidepressants, tranquilizers, and psychostimulants. And if you now know basically for which of these, uh, uh, which of disorders these drugs usually are, are targeting, then, and then you look at those specific disorders, and you see, again, if you look at one against the other, if you look carefully, whenever there's blue here, very often you find red on the other side, and so on. So here you have, for instance, schizophrenics of different types. You have depression patients, GAD, anxiety disorder, dementia, and so on. Uh, again, one column here represents the set of differences between patients of that disorder and controls. And again, the Keylock principle says if one of the drugs is an optimal target for that, uh, for, for that disorder, then the pattern that shows up here should be more or less the reverse of the pattern that shows up here. So to highlight again one example, I mean to also so it's certainly not a perfect thing. I mean also one one limitation of the thing is when you use, look into controls, one of the variables already might be at the maximum. You cannot increase or further decrease it at, anymore, so you might not see that effect uh, as nicely as we show it here. But overall, we 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 uh, the work here shows that that it's 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 an extremely useful tool of looking at the EG results this way. Here again, you have GAD uh, versus controls. Uh, Somnium versus placebo. This is absolute. This is relative power. Uh, and you, you see here again how decreases matches increase. And in some cases, not in all, even to tomographically. So, for instance, here in the occipital region is matched here uh, changes in, uh, also in the occipital regions. The Keylock principle works in other paradigms uh, of EEG as well. So if we look at Loretta quasi-tomographies, so you know that just looking at the scalp, it doesn't necessarily tell us in which brain area um, an activity is happening. With Loretta, we can identify, similar to brain imaging, the, the proper uh, brain area in a 3D fashion, in a volumetric fashion. And again, so if you see here these frontal uh, changes, for instance, in schizophrenics versus healthy controls, are here matched by frontal decreases in, in this case, halop, halop, haloperidol versus placebo. The same principle applies often also to uh, event-related potentials. For instance, if you look at P300 amplitudes, locate them again with Loretta, for instance, uh, we can see that here in depression versus controls, in that case, particularly here on the right side, there is a, a decreased P300 amplitude, which can be counteracted by an increase in citalopram versus placebo in the exact same uh, brain area. So that's why I said initially we're I'm talking about all paradigms. These key lock principles can be identified in, in each of them, including sleep. So in sleep disorder, and that's one particular favorite subject for, for, for uh, Bernd Soleto, who has been one, one of the most renowned uh, Austrian sleep researchers also. And he, his main argument is also uh, physicians should not give just a hypnotic to somebody who cannot sleep. 
Let's look at the particular pattern of what's happening in a specific type of insomnia and see what, what, which drug fits best. So I'll, I'll skip, skip here a little bit. For instance, we can list different types of reasons for insomnia, including anxiety disorder, depression, and so on, and how they affect sleep. So the first one is sleep efficiency, basically how much they sleep in, uh, during bed of, uh, the night time in bed. This is early, middle, and late insomnia. And these are the different sleep stages. So you can see that, especially with the sleep stages, that some disorders uh, influence slow wave sleep, others influence REM sleep, and you need to look for compounds that counteract those differences in the proper way uh, uh, by increasing or decreasing those particular sleep components. And that's, again, an expression of this Keylock principle. And uh, some of our work here in the Siesta Group with uh, the Swiss company Actelion, their compound Almorexin, it did not make the market, but we it's one representative of a very interesting uh, hypnotic drug uh, class, the Oryxin receptor antagonists. There are others around. A few already, a couple, one already made the market. Others are still in development. And here, what we did, in addition to, to just comparing drug versus placebo, what you get out of your typical study, we also included normative uh, data, healthy controls. And uh, why we did that is to show, I mean, here, for instance, the fear of many is that a, a oryxin receptor antagonist would increase REM to a level of pathology like a, 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 a neuroleptic, uh, narcoleptic, sorry, uh, like in a narcoleptic patient. And here we could show, especially if we show it in REM. So what is shown here is uh, placebo drug and the value of the, health, the normal control. So we're showing that, for instance, the sleep latency is too long in, in placebo, is shortened by the drug, but it's not shortened like in a way of making it pathological. If you fall asleep within a minute, that's a pathological sign, but it's shortened toward the normal values. And the same happens with REM. So the drug does inc increase REM, and it reduces REM latency, but not to a pathological level, but to the level that healthy controls have. And again, we could speak here of a key lock principle in the sense that we look at the entire pattern. How do the, in this case, primary insomniacs differ from, from controls? And how does the drug change one to the other? I see that my time is up. Uh, I would like to just mention them, I and of course, the, that's one of the challenges we should discuss later. If we talk about translation, what do we see in the rat? It's especially the where that we cannot say much about because in the rat we have typically much fewer electrodes. But as a summary, I wanted to show you that pharmaco-EG is an informative objective biomarker and that with the key lock principle, we, it can help us identify desired drug effects in a very interesting way. Here are some of the references I cited. Thank you very much for your attention. The question is about how we reconcile the acute versus the chronic effect or the long-term effect of a drug. I mean, that, that especially in treatment of depression, the effect of a drug would show up only after a long uh, treatment. That's certainly a very good question. I, I did not go into details of that. I mean, it's true what, what was shown here were acute effects. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I, I was simplifying the story. And, uh, I mean, in acute effects, you can see the major components of some of the patterns already show up and uh, they help you. But some others you would only see if you, if you look at it in the long term. And so the complete picture would, would have to put look at both. I agree. Okay, so the question is when we look at those entire patterns in this key log, whether we don't risk of uh, just reinventing uh, known patterns and missing out on news. I would, I would not see that because when you look at the entire pattern, you, you, you cannot as easily miss certain things as, as, as when you do when you don't look at the entire pattern. Give me an example from, of sleep. Here especially, I mean, if you, if, if you look at the, the typical hypnotic uh, phase two, phase three trials, they all look at sleep efficiency. 
And if, if you tell a company, say, yeah, but your drug might be very specific on REM sleep or on, mid, and on stage two sleep, and they say, oh, I don't want to look at that, but the FDA wants us to increase sleep efficiency, which in itself is not so true. So by, look, by taking a look at the entire pattern, I think we're more likely to find new ways, new, new patterns than, I mean, of course, I, I see what you mean. We, we don't, if we tie ourselves too much on the specific disorder pattern, you might be right, but I, my, in my opinion, I think, think looking at the whole picture makes it less likely to make sense.